Today we're going to be doing something a little different here at the Pirate's Port. Every so often I'd like to have a conversation with a different author that specializes in the golden age of piracy. This week I'll be talking with Bayless Brooks. Mr. Brooks is a maritime historian, genealogist, and writer who wrote several books on Blackbeard. Several episodes back in the video I made about Nassau, I mentioned that I'd be doing an upcoming video explaining why I believe Blackbeard's true name to be Edward Thatch, and Bayless Brooks' work is the reason for this. I have some links to his books on Amazon in the description, as well as our Discord, Patreon, and PayPal. Also, if you could take a moment to subscribe and like the video, I'd really appreciate it. And with that being said, I'd like to welcome him aboard. Hey Bayless, would you like to start off by giving the listeners a little more information about yourself? I'm from North Carolina, uh, born in the early 60s, and uh, raised only a few years after uh, Disney's movie, The the Blackbeard the Pirate, which was the seminal moment for you know pirate information in America. It was uh, it was the most influential part of pirate lore, at least recent pirate lore. And um, so, as I grew up, I was surrounded by everything pirate. Um, I went to camp, Camp Moorhead in uh, Moorhead City. I was probably about 12, 13 years old. And uh, we, we, the counselors had jokes about Blackbeard uh, because we were on the Pamlico Sound, too. It was, it was, we were right there. And uh, there, was, there was a lot of things about it. But anyway, um, I went to uh, college a couple of times. But the last time I went to uh, ECU, East Carolina University, and studied maritime studies, uh, got into... Uh, colonial landscapes. I was very interested in colonial history, but oddly enough, I was wasn't really interested in working on pirates. But um, it, I did find Blackbeard's family and sort of had to uh, to get into piracy from then on. So, can we start early on in your life and career? Uh, what first attracted you to learning more about pirates? As far as my early life um, and career, and what attracted me to, to learn more about pirates was. Um, Essentially, what I was just talking about the um, uh, growing up with Blackbeard in my life, and I was always interested in playing Blackbeard or playing a pirate. At, uh, I was pirate every year for Halloween, I think, and uh, I loved playing a pirate. I did, but I like playing the 1952 Disney version of a pirate. You know, the ard and the swinging from the yard arm and that kind of you know, and um, it was fun that way. Um, as an historian, uh, I was interested most in colonial landscapes. I really wasn't interested in pirates at all. And um, that uh, what really got me interested in studying pirates was uh, a blog that I had been writing while I was in school at, e at East Carolina. And uh, I, had, I wrote this blog. I mean, I was writing about pirates, about Blackbeard in specific. But um, there was a friend of mine who had uh, come up with this theory that Blackbeard might have actually been named Edward Beard, and he was supposed to be the son of James Beard in South Carolina, North Carolina. He was a fairly wealthy mariner at the time in, in both Carolinas. And um, so the idea, you know, up till then, nobody had ever found any information on, on Blackbeard's family. So it was just as reasonable a theory as any other. And um, so I explored it. And I thought, well, you know, before I write this blog entry on, on his theory, um, I'm going to have to find out if there's been anything discovered recently. Because, you know, Ancestry.com and libraries and, and institutions all across the world have been digitizing records. And there's a lot more available now than there ever was before. So maybe somebody has digitized records or at least come across something um, for, about Blackbeard that I need to include in, or review before I, I, I talk about this theory. Well, I, I looked quickly at Ancestry.com because, you know, I'm a genealogist too. And that... Um, that I've, I've been one for 30 years. And um, so I, I decided to, uh, to at least start there and see where it led me. Well, I put in a search for an Edward Teach 
supposedly around Jamaica, because that was the original theory everybody went on for hundreds of years. And uh, so I, you know, looking for Edward Teach around Jamaica in 1700. And I got a hit. I had did not expect to see a hit, but I got one. Uh, it was for an Edward Teach married to a Lucretia Teach with a son named Cox Teach. Well, I, 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 you know, I was dumbfounded. I'm like, okay, I was, you know, this was an actual record. This is not one of the many family uh, charts that people upload to Ancestry, which are not in any way, uh, they should not in any way be considered primary sources because they are researched by those people and they're not necessarily sourced, not always. Um, and you, you shouldn't take any of those, you know. But this was an actual primary source record, you know, with, of an Edward B. I mean, Edward uh, Teach in Jamaica in 1700. I'm like, no way. Uh, so I called the uh, ILL, or the Interlibrary Loan Department at my library, and I said, "Hey, can we can we get hold of uh, of these um, um, records, these Jamaican Anglican Church records?" Uh, is there any way I can get hold of those? Or can we get them, you know, sent to the library on microfilm and I can look at them? And she said, we can, but we don't have to because it's online already. <laughs> I was, uh, I was uh, flabbergasted that, that this stuff is online. You know, I'm totally flabbergasted by all of this. Because all of this uh, uh, digitization, uh, you know, has made, and, you know, computer technology has made records more numerous than we have been able to research them and, and probably will be able to research them for decades. There's a whole lot more available now than, than has ever been available. So uh, I went to the, to the website, which was the Latter-day Saints Church website, um, and just explored the records, uh, the, the wills, um, there was not, not, I'm sorry, not wills, um, birth, marriage, and death records of all the people in Jamaica. And I found numerous teaches when I did it. And I was able to put together a family chart of the teaches, a rudimentary chart anyway. And, um, so that helped me to establish the teach family. So I asked people in the Golden Age of Piracy subreddit, as well as the Pirate Sport Discord, if they had any questions to ask. One of them was this. Was there a specific moment you recall when you knew you'd just write a book about Blackbeard? Now, as far as whether or not I was going to write a book on Blackbeard, uh, well, this was the moment right here. It, uh, the, you can't have information in your hands that has not, or who has been searched for for the past 300 years. You know, and and not write about it. There's just no way I could. I would avoid writing about it. So um, I didn't want to write about pirates before because there's so much junk written about pirates out there that it would take me forever to to weed out all the chafe, you know, and and uh, come and get the actual data out of all that. But uh, I I was faced with the fact that I had to now. So. I, I, I wrote the book and of course I had a lot to write about because it's like 670 pages in quest for Blackbeard it was um, well this was after I wrote the first article for uh, North Carolina Historical Review that was I had to get it out there first um, and that was a way to do it but then quest came along and if, even since then I've come up with more uh, information and uh, republished it as uh, an ebook um, in last year, 2020. So, in your research, you came across the Thatch family in Jamaica. Was finding that information immediately obvious as to how significant it ended up being? No. So, you're wondering if the finding of the Teach family was immediately obvious. Well, I was searching for them and I got a hit. And yeah, so yes, it was immediately obvious to me that that was uh, the family that I was looking for. Well, at least I knew it had a good chance. And after searching uh, for the other data, the you know, mother, father, fam, children, all, I finally came to the conclusion that this definitely had to be the family. 
My another thing that um, contributed to that was the uh, uh, discovery of the wills and deeds that belonged to the teachers that were in the Register General's Department in Jamaica. A um, a researcher friend of mine, uh, Diane Golding Frankson, who runs a website called Genealogy Plus Jamaica. Um, she's a well-known genealogist from from Jamaica and has been on TV a couple of times uh, doing other research projects. And um, I asked her if she could look up these records for me since I didn't want to have to go to Jamaica myself. And um, she found them and uh, she sent them to me in an email, uh, gave me digital copies of them. And when she sent the email, the, this, the, what's funny about this, that, uh, she, she said, um, is this the Edward Teach I think it is? <laughs> I said, yeah, I think so. And w one of those records that, that she helped me find was uh, a 1706 deed for uh, the Edward Teach, the son of Edward Teach. In other words, we, we had two of them. Uh, but he, this Edward Teach was serving in the Royal Navy aboard the HMS Windsor at the time. And um, he's, his father had died, Edward the Senior, and uh, he was basically giving his you know, uh, inheritance to his family so that they could run the plantation in, you know, in his absence because he was obviously in the Navy. He couldn't be home to help with the plantation. And uh, so that was uh, that was that was a, that was the clincher right there. I mean, I found I, that was a record about Blackbeard himself. That was Edward Blackbeard Teach Jr. Another viewer question. In your search of historical records about Blackbeard, particularly the government ones, did you find anything surprising or unexpected? As far as my search of government records, um, the I didn't find as much as surprising in, in the government records because the government records have always been relatively available to us. Um, so there really wasn't a whole lot in, new, new that come out of, uh, of government sources. But uh, there have been a few uh, that uh, basically just fill in holes. They just you know, fill in some gaps that existed. But the most, the most revelatory uh, records, of course, were the genealogical ones because nobody had ever seen those. Um, although they had been in America for the, uh, since at least the 60s, uh, the LDS Church in Utah had copies of the Jamaican Anglican Church records at least since about 1965. So they've been here for decades just waiting for somebody to find old Eddie Teach. Have you come across any information on Lock and Cord or other pirates that Blackbeard operated with? Oh, well, as far as information on Le Concorde or other pirates that Blackbeard operated with, um, they're, like I said, I, I tend to go into a uh, genealogical study of these people as much as possible. And... Um, well, what uh, I worked uh, somewhat with the uh, QAR uh, project uh, at ECU. Uh, they were in charge of ex excavating the, the Queen Anne's Revenge, and um, they had done a significant amount of research, which is available on their website, by the way, at the uh, QAR project at ECU. Uh, the information that they came out was was extraordinary. They they studied French records. Um, that uh, basically told about the the different uh, well the French aspect of what happened you know the point of view and it was um, and they talked about more specifically about crew that they had taken from La Concorde um, and how many slaves they took from La Concorde there was a lot of serious amount of information that came from that I studied the French records in more detail later and then found quite a bit more. Um, so that was that was also something that was um, um, new to the subject was French records. Uh, I, I've also met other people who were studying Spanish records in detail, which since we're getting into these now, we're being able to put together a much more um, full picture of what was taking place. So that's all, all that's very helpful.
As far as other pirates that Blackbeard operated with, the, I know one that, um, in particular, that he uh, that he didn't like. Uh, there was one named Edward James, and I believe he's the one uh, whose ship he burnt uh, just before he burnt the uh, Protestant Caesar in um, Honduras Bay. Um, that he had taken a, a pardon and. Blackbeard basically did not like the idea that he took a pardon and he burned his ship, as well as um, William Wire's uh, Protestant Caesar, because he was from Boston, and Boston had to pay for hanging uh, Sam Bellamy's crew in his mind. So, um, But yeah, there, there's a few other instances that uh, I write about in, um, in my latest book, The Dictionary of Pirate Biography, which is a, basically a genealogical and historical exploration of every pirate that I have known between 1713 and 1720. Um, it, it, uh, I think there's about 726 or some, there's, there's over 700 entries in this book of pirates or people associated with pirates. What are your thoughts on Blackbeard intentionally running Queen Anne's Revenge aground? What do I think about Blackbeard intentionally running Queen Anne's Revenge aground? He did not do that. <laughs> I'm quite certain. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's fun. Everybody wants to think Blackbeard's a nasty guy. He's a nasty pirate. He's a bad guy. Look at what he did. He married 14 women, which is also not true. And uh, <clears throat> he, he whored one of them out. That's not true. He ran his ship aground because he was just trying to get rid of his men. He was not a vicious person. Sorry. I hate to tell you, but he's just not. Uh, what happened? I studied this in detail in Quest. Uh, in the book Quest for Blackbeard, you, you can find the, uh, I think it's in Chapter 13. There's a whole section in there about uh, uh, what was doing this a study of the people the um who were marooned supposedly marooned by by blackbeard and um well i guess they were marooned sort of hey, you'll have to read the book i mean they weren't really marooned but they were just kind of uh pushed aside for the, for the time being in in teach's mind i think uh but but if you look at the records um the records themselves during the entire court proceeding um, none of them said that he wrecked it on purpose. None of them even believed that he meant to maroon them for forever. They, none of them believed that. Because the island they were marooned on was right on the side of the channel, the main channel that ran through that part of Core Sound. Um, so any ship that passed by the island or passed through that, that channel would see them on the island. You know, there was no way that, that he did this on purpose because, you know, well, marooning on purpose because they were obviously going to get picked up by somebody. And um, he did the same thing with his ship. He accidentally ran it. It was phenomenally amazing that he even made it through Beaufort Inlet or would have made it through Beaufort Inlet. So the idea that he would have wrecked is, is easy to believe. And uh, the... Uh, the only people who said that he did that on purpose, yes, David Harriet said that, and he was an actual witness, but David Harriet was, and Ignatius Pell were the only two people who were given immunity from prosecution in that trial to say nasty things about Blackbeard, in my opinion. I think that uh, Nicholas Trott basically said, I need to support my, my friend uh, Spotswood over there in Virginia, and he's trying to... Uh, to uh, you know, convict this this, uh, or at least cover for his uh, killing of, of the uh, of Edward Teach, and uh, we need to uh, make help him out as much as possible. So I, I really think that was just a just a good cop bad cop kind of you know, you know it was underhandedness. What do you believe as far as how the last battle with Maynard went down? The whole exchange between Blackbeard and Maynard and the quote, damnation seize my soul if I give you quarters or take any from you. Obviously this was written in a general history of pirates, so there is no source, but do you believe the quotes referenced are plausible? Have you ever come across any records from Maynard 
or his people that described the battle in more detail. The last battle with Blackbeard, the one, the one where he actually did actually probably kill some people, um, was the only evidence that we have of that battle. We do have a lot of good evidence, primary source evidence, uh, through Captain Ellis Brand, um, who was the leader of the expedition, the final expedition to get him, and, um, and through George Gordon. We don't have any actual sources directly from Lieutenant Maynard himself. Um, <clears throat> there, we know that there's a letter out there, but we don't have a copy of it. We just, we just know that there, there was mention of it in some of the uh, primary source material about the battle itself. Now, the letter that's published by uh, the newspaper in, in England about uh, his, that includes this part about damnation seize my soul if I give you quarters or take any from you, um, that those kind of flowery moments, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, bravado, you know. It, it may be true, but we don't know that it is true. And uh, the, the interesting thing is that the guy who actually published General History of Pirates um, under the pseudonym Charles Johnson was Nathaniel Mist, who was a uh, editor of a newspaper, the uh, Saturday Post, Saturday Morning Post or something like that, in, in London. And uh, the paper that published this letter, supposed letter that, that Maynard had written to a friend of his, Lieutenant Simons, in uh, New England uh, was in that newspaper, Nathaniel Miss newspaper. So the man who wrote the book about the pirates in 1724 was the same man who published that letter. So um, that kind of leads me to think that you can't trust what he wrote, you know? Okay, so lastly, I'd like to ask a few other viewer submitted questions. Uh, on Blackbeard Reconsidered, you challenge the traditional violent image of Blackbeard. Can the same skepticism be cast on the traditional views of other pirates of the time as well? And if so, to what extent? As far as um, my traditional or the traditional violent image of Blackbeard, uh, that was a recent invention, actually. Um, no one in England, very few people, I don't say no one, but very few people in England, and, very, and no one really in America, I don't think anyone here, actually believed that pirates were bad in the first place. I think that uh, England uh, used the colonial newspapers at the time, only available since 1704, the, the Boston Newsletter, to damn teach in their eyes, to, to uh, get rid of piracy in a rhetorical sense, you know, to destroy him in, in the media. Uh, I think it was the first time they were able to do it, so they actually used it. And uh, in Quest for Blackbeard, you'll also, if you read it closely, you'll get the impression that I think America is still a land that was a was invented by pirates. America had been founded by pirates. And uh, so we still sort of behave in a piratish way sometimes. Uh, I think it's just in our DNA. Blackbeard was certainly not the man that you read about in a general history. He was nowhere near that kind of man. Um, he, he was a, a, a good family man. Uh, he was worried about his family when he, he gave them the land that he inherited. Uh, he, he, was, he had a daughter, um, Elizabeth. A, I, and and we, only, we don't even know who his wife was. We know he had one, at least the mother of Elizabeth. But we, as far as other women, there's nowhere, anywhere, in any primary source that talks about him with other women. So 14 wives? That's crazy. I mean, <laughs> it's just nuts. What, in your opinion, is Blackbeard's greatest achievement? Uh, his greatest achievement, in his mind, I think, might be as a pirate, would be the capture of uh, Le Concorde and renaming it Queen Anne's Revenge. To him, that was the ultimate, because he was so he was very upset about the French. And anything he did to the French was was a continuation of what he had done, you know, for his entire career as a, as a naval, uh, or in the Navy, in the Royal Navy. Um, they, they fought the French constantly because the French were invading um, Jamaica. They kept coming in and stealing uh, 
maroons who had run off to the north, they would come out on the north side of the island and take them. And, you know, as, as far as Jamaicans of the time uh, were thinking, this, they were stealing their, pro you know, their um, property. And uh, so they, they, were, they were definitely, definitely ticked off at the French. So Blackbeard probably grew up with this, and, you know, all his life. He, uh, he's, he's been hating the French. His family has always hated the French. So I think that was probably one of one of his his uh, ultimate achievements, and of course, you know, um, Nathaniel Mist or Charles Johnson wrote about him as you know capturing the the Queen Anne's Revenge and making that. So I, he he concurs obviously, and um, I think most people today would say that's probably the you know the funny thing is that the Queen Anne's Revenge was a large ship, but. It wasn't the only large ship in the area at the time, and pirates had used ships like that similarly uh, in the past. Not just not just Blackbeard, but so I wouldn't want to stretch that beyond reason and say oh, that's the best ship in the seas. It, it was not. It was um, it was just a big ship. What is the most frustrating myth or misconception surrounding Blackbeard? And as far as uh, the most frustrating myth or misconception is that is that Blackbeard was supposed to be a very mean and nasty guy, and he was not. He was simply a, a well-to-do gentleman mariner who had uh, basically frustrations with uh, the French and, and some of the Spanish, but, but mostly it was with England, too. He was just as mad at England as we were in 1776, only he didn't have the resources to make 1776 be, or 1716 let's say become 1776 so what's the most interesting thing you learned about blackbeard a little known tidbit or something that just makes you smile to know it just constantly makes me laugh to think he was a, in the royal navy that he that that deed we we have in 1706 of him saying i am the son of edward Teach senior, and I am on his royal, uh, on his Majesty's royal navy ship, uh, Windsor. Um, you know, I, I just kind, I just crack up every time I, I see that. Anything you'd like to add, or questions for me? Uh, like I said, I have uh, the most recent book, the Dictionary of Pirate Biography, uh, which talks about seven hundred and some pirates between seventeen thirteen and, and seventeen twenty. I'm probably going to try to write a second volume later talking about the later pirates because I couldn't include um, guys like Ed Lowe um, but uh, I'm going to have to uh, explore that a little bit and see what happens um, I've written also about um, the five pirates who went to the East Indies um, and uh, they Basically, to, it, was, it was 1719 to 1721, two, not four, we'll say four. And um, it, they were basically there to try to recapture pirate glory. They were going after Henry Every's uh, um, it, reputation, trying to recapture that glory. And um, the, there's, it's actually, even though it's an historical book, it's a, and it's very well so sourced, um, it it's also hilarious in many ways because these guys were they, they kind of screwed up a lot and <laughs> I've written a few other short books um, around those but uh, the the quest for Blackbeard and the sailing east um, are probably the the two consequential historical books that I've written uh, one book I'm working on is a fictional re recreation of Teach's journal uh, the one that he supposedly lost when he was killed and um, it the original one probably burned up in a, a Virginia courthouse fire in 1834 I think um, but uh, it was kind of fun uh, talking about Blackbeard as though he were really there and every step of the way I could kind of include little bits about what he was thinking about um, the the British about the about and the French and how much he hated them and 
and his family talked about his how much he loved his family and uh, and, and of course what it was like being a uh, uh, a slave runner with uh, Captain Diebel, his former captain, uh, Captain Jonathan Diebel, on the Barbados Merchant. Before he joined the Navy, he was in he was in the service then, or in the service of Captain Jonathan Diebel. And um, I, this book, well, again, this is fiction. This is not real, but I try to make it look as real as possible. Um, but it, it's it's called. Uh, uh, I am not Blackbeard, and uh, it's uh, it, it's going to be. It's taking a lot of my time, though. Unfortunately, it's uh, it takes a lot more time to create fiction than it does f <laughs> than it does uh, just talk about nonfiction, just writing history. I do want to say that uh, that I very much like the videos you produce on Pirate Sport. I think that's. Uh, a wonderful way of actually seeing history in action and uh, and I thank you for inviting me today thanks thanks for coming on today Bayless as I said earlier I have links to several of your books in the description and I highly recommend you guys all check them out as always if you have any ideas for future episodes please comment below or join us in discord if you're enjoying the content please subscribe and if you can help out by donating on PayPal or patreon that's much appreciated as well <laughs>